Well, thank you. And uh, again, my name is Vivek Matthew. Uh, I wanted to thank especially Collegium and the incredible leadership they have. Um, there are a lot of innovative little corners here and there all through the nation doing things in higher ed. There's very few of them who are collecting and disseminating ideas and actually having a presence not just in your local campus, uh, but far beyond that. And so I'm a testament to that, that uh, Dan is actually helping connect two different, very different networks that were never connected. One astounding thing is almost all of our organizations 20 years ago did not exist. So this is a very new, fast-moving movement. And it's still very early in a way. And so um, the direction it could go is way up in the air. Um, to that end, I'm going to mention a little bit about uh, how we've kind of thought about it a bit at Cornell, at Chester and and I didn't develop any of this. I inherited it. It was a it's been, Chester Nouse has been around for 25 years, and the kind of model that I'll talk about is uh, really in the last 10 years. Um, and I'm not sure I'm even endorsing it for everybody. I just think it's a view that kind of should be on the table. I, I might even share a little bit at the end of kind of my own doubts about its future, but it has something to offer. But we're not sure yet. We're, it's a very early experiment. Like you said, these are experiments. And so uh, in, the, in the spirit of experiments, we're going to talk about you know, how these things might play out. So I want to start talking about a common conversation that I've had with faculty, anybody who's been teaching for more than two decades. So somebody 20 plus years of teaching, if you ask them, how do you think students and co college culture has changed? and then you prepare for the torrential onslaught that you're gonna get. A lot of these themes actually came up last night in the wonderful session with Zena Hitz. So when you ask faculty, we hear over and over again, um, well look, you know, you know, the number one thing, they're always in their phones. The students, they don't have the attention spans they would have in the past. They don't read books. They don't know kind of the kind of prior background you might expect from a traditional liberal arts background. Um, they're unprepared, they're undeveloped, they feel more entitled. There's you know, a whole laundry list of things that you'll hear. And now I'm kind of, I'm over 40, so I'm crusty enough to feel like most of it is basically right. But <laughs> I think it's all kind of misleading. And I realized this when I read a description of these complaints from a faculty member about students being uninterested in intellectual life, overly fixated on status and credentials, and never really into true liberal learning and caught up in the college drinking culture and all the moral kind of debauchery that you know, college entails. Except this was all from the 1830s, uh, 1820s. It was John Henry Newman uh, <laughs> complaining about Oriel College in Oxford where he was teaching in these undergrads. And you know, wouldn't you know it, they're all, they're all kind of degenerating over there. And so we are joining, in a sense, uh, those old folks of us, like a long tradition of seeing, in a sense, the weaknesses of the generations to come without maybe always being attuned to the strengths. And so that's kind of our job, I think. You know, we need to point out what's being lost at any given moment. Um, and at the same time, we can't be the only voice at the table. So I want to take a different tack. Instead of the kind of usual complaint about the student generation kind of thing, let's take it from the point of view of the student experience, where you get a very different kind of problem or puzzle set up. So everybody in the student world is probably familiar with the world of college brochures and the propaganda they entail. They, uh, they give a picture of college life, which is anything but the truth. You know, like it's, it somehow gives you this impression of what college, you know, the, 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 the promise of it. It has a sort of sheen. And um, when you look at these things, you wonder, like, are we setting up these expectations for students that are going to be completely shattered? So, you know, typically, if you talk to students, they'll be like, look, I came to college thinking I would get this transformative experience. Oh, I'm going to find my best friends for life, because that'll be so easy to find friends, right? That's going to be super easy. And then, uh, oh, I'm going to have all these conversations about big questions. It's going to be exhilarating. I'm going to actually have these, you know, deep 2 a.m. dorm room conversations. And surely, there'll be faculty who will come and mentor me and take me under their wing and show me the ropes. And, and then, you know, it's pretty quickly that the kind of scales fall off, and they realize it is anything but that. It is a complete, you know, soul-sucking, deadening grind that seems to like take all the joy out of college. And how could those brochures have been so wrong? You know, it was really a bait and switch in so many ways. So, if that's the reality, and we've all probably had conversations with students like this, or even experienced it ourselves, what can we do? And I want to suggest maybe there's a different type of institutional profile that could help here. Um, looking at all of these recent kind of innovations, I'm going to talk about, in particular, the kind of study center that I'm at that I have experience with. Again, I didn't develop it. I just saw that they were doing it, and I thought this was amazing. And it works on the idea of a residential college model. Now, when you hear the word college, don't think, you know, 
a standalone accredited degree granting organization. Think of residential colleges, like many, there's like hundreds of, of universities which divide up their life, their campus life, into residential colleges. And they usually have you know, dining rooms and, and kind of a common life, and they have cultural events, and they have some faculty who live in them, and stuff like that. And that is, in a way, a lot of the source of the image or illusion of what college was supposed to be about, all the great stuff that you were supposed to get. The residential college system is their attempt, in a way, to produce that or to make a conducive atmosphere for it. So there's something here that is worth kind of looking at. Now, we at Chesterton House, we have a very particular instantiation of this. We have a two-acre campus with about 40 Cornell students living on it at any given time. Um, mostly undergrads, but some graduate students. This is not really a full extent. We have another building on this side, and it's kind of uh, changed a bit since this picture. But um, what it offers is Cornell students who are doing engineering or the ag school or in the ILR school, the, the labor relations, or whatever different major they are in, to also have an intellectual life and a community life that's centered around a common good and some sort of common shared uh, ideal. Um, and in a way, it's like what residential colleges could be it's hard to really kind of make it there uh, if you have a big anonymous R1 institution that's really kind of connected with very little other than its, its kind of own self-importance. So the idea here is you're trying to combine something that in our kind of world, for those of us who are in this kind of interest in classical Christian traditions, is very familiar, right? The, the Cenobitic tradition of monks gathered around the table in this kind of way of like community life as being not just a kind of thing you do to live together, not just say a bunch of Christians living together, but to live together Christianly, as the slogan goes up at Chester House. In other words, like we are committed to a common project of actually growing in holiness together. Uh, and we actually need each other to do that. We'll need some friction. We'll actually need some problems and, and conflicts to be able to acquire virtues. Uh, the, all the moral virtues require the, the, the kind of habitual practice that it takes to deal with difficult people like ourselves. And so that kind of practice comes in a residential community much more than the kinds of programs where you see them for two hours a week or something like that. And you really don't know their life in the way that you would. And the usual thing is students are craving that. They actually want all the stuff in the college brochures that points to that kind of transformative experience. And that often requires a kind of community life that colleges today are just set up to be anonymous and really cold in institutional places. So for example, if I eat in the Cornell dining rooms, you know, they have their own residential college system. If I, if I eat there, I'll see most, the vast majority of students are not in conversation. They're on their phones. They're alone. There's deep amount of isolation. Many of them, if they are in conversation, the dominant conversation topic, I kid you not, will be like preparing for interview questions for the recruiting fair, which is such a sad way to spend your college. I mean, I, I, I'm not kidding. I'm, there's a group of students I, I just ate with the other day. That's the substance of most of their friendship. Like 80% of their friendship was basically preparing for, you know, like, like trading, like how we're going to get jobs in the right places. Something's gone a little off. If you have a community life that's organized around a common ideal of something transcendent, you actually have a chance of breaking out of some of this stuff. Well, the other ideal, of course, is the one that the universities love to trump in their academic side, which is the, the pursuit of truth in some sort of like communal way. And you know, the humanities seminar room is the, is the characteristic kind of exemplification of it. Well, if you put these two together, you get, in a sense, what is a very old model. It's nothing new at all. It's actually how the kind of original picture we have of college life, which is you know, largely an Anglo, mostly UK creation, um, that formed, in a sense, with religious people living together, studying the great text, thinking about these deeper things, and working on their common holiness together. All those things put together were a very natural pairing to them. So what we're suggesting is that's the kind of vision forward that I think offers something of promise. And now. If you think, wait, you know, we've been focused on a different set of things. Actually, they're very complementary. So 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Chester and House was basically focused around graduate students and bringing visiting speakers and book clubs and symposium. And then we, in a sense, got this campus. And it didn't stop any of that. It actually exponentially increased it. And now it has a, a very coherent organizing core around it. And so that's something I think any study center uh, could, or any institute could be thinking of in the future for their own kind of vision of where they want to go. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to close with a note of skepticism because I'm like, I'm not sure this is, you know, th these have their own problems too. We have our brochures too. We can believe our own propaganda. I'm not always sure we're right. Um, so here's some, I'm going to mention three risks that I think about, I worry about a lot, and we can talk about them in Q&A if you want. So the first is a kind of institutional failure. Okay, this is a little hard to explain, but a lot of times, I'm in many rooms and conversations where we decline, we, we, we lament the decline of liberal arts and we talk about how you know, we become hyper-professionalized and all that. That's a really familiar conversation. And yet there's almost this like, 
failure of imagination to think maybe higher ed may need to be disrupted in a very severe way. We don't know. I just want to be agnostic on that. Like, why do we need to take 18 to 22 year olds and put them in extremely expensive residential programs to get this credential mill going, whatever? Is, if that whole system were to crack up and your entire institutional strategy relies on its stain, I worry a little bit, and I, I worry we're in this position a little bit. You know, what, what if we actually move to a more skills-based kind of education system and, you know, we don't know that. Now, the interesting thing is for those institutes and study centers at the really tippy-top elite places like Penn and Cornell and all those uh, kind of fancy status-obsessed places, it's very likely they will survive whatever this crack-up is. And like, because there's always going to be an elite that will want the full-blooded experience of college. But I do worry, maybe this becomes, and this gets to a kind of a third worry here, uh, it becomes a bit of an elitist project. And I don't know what to do about that, except that I thought Zita, uh, her you know, experiences that she relates with the Catherine Project, I've, I've taught in a prison system where I had a, a tremendously successful and really great uh, pedagogical, uh, you know, uh, philosophical instruction in, and discussion in a prison. So there's, there's more than one way to do it, but you just want to think about, well, for your local institution, your forms of life, and whatever the way that things have, have organized, how, how would it work for you? I, I don't know. I'm not even sure for us how we're, we're thinking through in the future how that might look if there's a major reorganization in American higher education. A correlative of that institutional failure is if your entire strategy depends on the good graces of faculty members or career admi administrative bureaucrats in your institution, your host institution, well, you got to have some sort of plan B because those people are going to turn over eventually. And we experienced that at Cornell. At one point, we, were, we had friends top to bottom from the president to the provost and everything. And then in one cycle and about 10 years later, they're all gone. So we want to think about some way to get some ideological independence. And so I'll, I'll get to number two here. But curiously, I think having a piece of dirt you own with people who live there and embody a common life really does give you one little piece of insurance that the university may go different directions. Their administrators may suddenly change their minds about you, but you'll be around. You can keep doing good work with students. So that's something to think about. And the second, I'm going to go in that order here. I'll end with this. The ideological failure, there is a temptation to see the kind of worlds we are kind of trying to construct of virtuous communities within the university as a kind of reactionary bubble against the big, you know, dangerous university. And so really now, we just become a counter-programming channel to everything that's wrong with them. And there's a way in which that's kind of a, I think it's, it's, it's an, an uneasy failure of the classical liberal tradition itself, which was always open-ended and always willing to bring in its own critics. And that's what makes it so powerful. And so one of the things I worry about, and particularly with the classical Christian movement, of which we're kind of part of, is that sometimes it can be a little bit tunnel, like siloed in. And it's like, it's not really interested in hearing its own critics. It's really interested in just propagating its own kind of vision. Well, that's nice, but... It's actually more robust than that. It can take it in a way, and it's actually really good. It's probably the only thing that I think can bring in its worst critics and like carefully and charitably and sympathetically hear them out. So these are risks that I think in any you know, endeavor to build these things, you're always going to have. And again, I don't really know what to do with them exactly, but I think they're kind of worth keeping on the table with the, both the promise and the peril of this. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, because I don't have much time, I'm going to be brief uh, in my praise for Collegium. I would willingly say a lot more um, if it wasn't going to uh, eat into the remarks I've prepared. Um, Collegium has been kind enough to include me in a number of their activities, uh, not quite from the beginning, but the Groundhog Day lecture that Dan alluded to was relatively early on um, and a real privilege. And since then, since I started working in a somewhat similar institute uh, up in New Haven, um, I've just been delighted and uh, incredibly impressed at what they've been able to accomplish. I think there's enough similarity in our work that I um, have some understanding how difficult this can be to do. Um, I would say that what they've achieved in the last 10 years is a vindication of the founding vision, which it is, but it's also a testimony to enormous hard work and dedication and, and faith uh, on the part of many people here. Um, and I'm, I'm so uh, impressed by that. So um, the title we were given was Forming Moral Persons in the Age of Chat GPT. Um, I'm going to start with a few preliminaries, and then there are about three points I want to hit. 
Um, the first is I've taken moral formation quite broadly um, to include the cultivation of virtues. There is a history of dividing virtues into moral and intellectual virtues, with moral virtues being things like courage, justice, temperance. Um, intellectual virtues, it's more of an amorphous list that people will often talk about. Uh, curiosity, fair-mindedness, intellectual humility, and things like that. I think this is a perfectly legitimate distinction, provided we keep in view that inquiry of the kind that universities uh, are houses of, but of, of the kind that all of us have to engage in, is itself a kind of activity. It's a collective activity, something we do together, and as such requires both intellectual and moral virtues. So they're all part of what's necessary, and failures of inquiry can be as much uh, moral failures as intellectual ones. Um, I also took it to include the cultivation of values, learning to value what's truly valuable um, and not what is not. Um, in one sense, any time you spend living in a university, in a traditional residential experience, there are great many people who are enrolled students who don't have that experience, but that's the kind of university experience I have in view primarily. How could young people come and live and work in close community for four years without being formed by that experience. So there's some sense in which universities can't help but be places of moral formation. But I take the question before us not to be about that sort of accidental, inadvertent moral formation, but intentional, deliberate moral formation. The kind you do when you want to cultivate specific virtues in specific people and specific values in specific people. And there, this takes me to the first point I want to hit, I think we can't seriously assess the possibilities and prospects of what can be done at the university without seeing how much that university has evolved. Um, I've heard it said that of the 66 oldest institutions, that is to say institutions which still exist today and have a continuous history of sort of visible existence, um, over 60 of them are universities. These are almost uniquely old institutions. I think we have to take seriously how much over the history of these institutions they have been repurposed and retrofitted again and again and again. There's a kind of rhetoric you sometimes see in context of university reform discussions where people talk about universities losing their way. And so we have to return them to their true proper calling. Um, it seems to me deeply unclear what that would mean. Uh, with institutions which have as rich and complex histories as these ones. Um, it also seems to me that in the more recent history of university, universities have been changed both in their social purpose and in their scale. At the, at the, turn, of the, 20th, at the turn of the 19th century, when the 19th century became the 20th century, slightly under 3% of the American population completed the college degree. By the end of the 20th century, that number was closer to 25%. This has had some interesting effects. Um, a college degree has, in some ways, become more and more expected. I've heard it said one of the reasons why college keeps on getting more expensive is because not going to college keeps on getting more expensive. The penalty you pay for not having a diploma, the doors that are shut, um, ha have increased and increased. Um, also, the economic returns are less because you're no longer as distinguished. Simply having a diploma it's not universal, but no longer does it make you stand out to the same degree. And so there's a sense of compulsion. You have to go, but the returns are often um, less than people had hoped for based on the historic experiences uh, of college graduates. The exception, of course, being the elite universities. Degrees from those really are scarce and carry an enormous premium. Um, and this is one of the reasons why these institutions receive disproportionate focus and attention. Of course we should care about the moral formation of elites. Definitionally, they will be influential and powerful. Their characters will matter. But I think you have to take into account that what you can do is affected by why people are there. Um, the, the, the sales pitch for an Ivy League or other elite university degree is a kind of flexibility. This will open many doors. It is not a key design for any one door. Some people will go and use specialist knowledge they have learned in courses in engineering or the applied sciences, but many people won't. Many people have a credential, the value of which is it signals a tremendous intelligence combined with a tremendous work ethic, a willingness to dedicate yourself, organize your, um, your time well, and stick to a task. That's an enormously valuable um, signal to send, but the very agnosticism about the ends to which it will be used 
affects the trajectory of people coming through these institutions. I think an interesting comparison here is with the military academies. If somebody comes to West Point, it's unequivocal what the purpose of that institution is, and they know what they're signing up to. It's obvious why particular character traits would be demanded of people who are going to be officers risking their lives and the lives of others in the US military. And this is an institution where every waking hour is dedicated into turning you to a certain type of person. Um, my claim here does not involve saying they are enormously successful at this. My claim is this, there's a kind of unity of purpose. Uh, there's a vocation that uh, institution has because there's a vocation that people coming through it um, expect to occupy. And they understand why that would necessarily involve moral formation. Okay. Um, now I want to say, the second point I wanted to make is about the comparative advantage of working in extracurricular spaces. Um, people who want to shake things up at universities have historically tended to look first and foremost to curricular form. There should be a class in this. People should learn more about this. And changing what goes on in the classroom has really been seen as um, the, the goal to which everyone is striving. Um, there's a sort of appeal to efficiency here. Well, given that you have to get one of these credentials anyway, why don't you get it while also getting a robust liberal arts education? Why don't you get it while also getting uh, an encounter with the great works of the Western tradition and so on and so on? It's a twofer, a threefer, bargain. And your time is, is limited. Why not try and get all these things taken care of in one package? Well, the difficulty trying to do them all at once will always result in situations where the different goals uh, come into conflict. Um, I think I'm having a conversation with a student about sort of Aristotle's uh, ethics. They're worried about me being a roadblock on their way to medical school. Um, and that's not their fault. That's built into uh, tying the pedagogy to the credentialing so, so tightly. So I want to say the inefficiency of working in extracurricular spaces where you have nothing to offer but the thing itself can also be an enormous advantage because there's a clarity of purpose there. Um, I'm willing to confront students and challenge them more readily precisely because I don't have gatekeeping power in my current position. They don't have to worry about what I have to think about them unless they regard my judgment as having something that's worth paying attention to. Um, but I'm not the gatekeeper, and I do think that makes other kinds of relationships um, freer and potentially more fruitful. Um, so I, I, I think, although we shouldn't give up on the idea of curricular reform, uh, we shouldn't regard that as the gold standard or the default for trying to change the culture of universities or change the people in them. Um, and this is why I think we, uh, Vivek has already sort of alluded to the, the history of the university. Um, we should get out of the habit of calling it the academy. Our origins are medieval. It's changed a lot, but it's always been a credentialing institution, always. The academy was a school in the literal sense. From, from the word scole, it's a place of leisure, a place people free to choose what to do with their time would naturally go to pursue inquiries which are worthwhile for their own sake. And universities have never been that, though they have included it as part of their culture. Um, so credentials send necessary signals. They perform a valuable social role. But we always have to take seriously how the prominence of that role constrains what we can and can cannot accomplish within them. OK, um, the final point. Um, I was preparing this, and then I, I went back to read the original email, and I saw the chat GPT thing. I was like, oh, no. I, I, <laughs> I better have some, something to say about that. So I'm, I do have things to say about that. Um, but let me, let me use it as an illustration. I'm in agreement with those who think that ChatGPT doesn't so much introduce a new problem as bring an existing problem uh, to the point of crisis. Um, many people, I think, have said fairly, if we were doing our job well, it wouldn't be hackable in this way. It's a sign of a bad assignment that you can produce the an answer algorithmically. Um, and that seems right to me. I don't want to sort of contest that. Um, but I do think it's worth revisiting the question of why we ask students to write papers in the first place. Um, what is wrong with school plagiarism? Really? Um, one common answer is it's a kind of theft. Plagiarism is literary theft, intellectual theft. But some students pay for it. Before ChatGPT, people would pay other people to 
uh, write essays for them. Some would have essay banks. Some would give them away for free as an act of generosity. But there's no theft there. Um, it seems to me the failure of that explanation of what's wrong is it doesn't tie the legitimate insistence on originality with the distinctive pedagogical goals of the university. It has to be you that writes it, because the goal was never the paper. The goal was the way you would be transformed in writing it. So I want to share a, um, a quotation for you. This is uh, by a, a 19th century English classicist called Mark Patterson from a, a book he wrote, a uh, biography of the Renaissance humanist uh, Isaac Casselbon. Knowledge is not the thing known, but the mental habit which knows. So it is with learning. And he, he's still writing at a time when learning was mainly focused on the classics, and that's reflected in these remarks. Learning is a peculiar compound of memory, imagination, scientific habit, accurate observation, all concentrated through a prolonged period on the analysis of the remains of literature. The result of this sustained mental endeavor is not a book, but a man. It cannot be embodied in print. It consists in the living word. Um, just as we should not flatter ourselves uh, by naming ourselves after the academy, um, uh, so we should get out of the habit of talking about the production of knowledge. Um, the, the role of a university is not to produce knowledge, and the language of production misrepresents what knowledge is. Universities produce knowers, and knowing is a collective activity. Um, so in, in the two and a half minutes I have left, um, I want to suggest one thing we can do is try to instruct students, partly by our own example, and our own example is essential here. Um, we need to be exemplars of the careful use and constructive use of language in inquiry. Um, computer, it, um, in the 90s, uh, when postmodernism in, in literary departments was kind of in its heyday, uh, people used to produce, with far less sophisticated technologies than ChatGPT, postmodernism generators. Just hit send, it'll generate an infinite supply of jargon-filled essays. Um, and then there are certain individuals who had very distinctive styles, and you'd sort of do the, the generator for like, an essay by Camille Paley or something like that. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an odd way in which, insofar as academic culture has been um, infected by celebrity culture, like other celebrity cultures, it rewards people for becoming caricatures of themselves. Um, and that's reflected in, in the sort of the Camille Paley generator or the um, Derrida generator or something like that. Um, so, so much of our, our speech is, these days in contemporary culture, the university and without the university, um, is shibboleths, shogun, slogans, and cliches. I shouldn't have put those words so closely together. Um, a, um, a slogan uh, comes from the Scots Gaelic uh, for army shout. We might say war cry. It's not a claim. It's a call to action. Um, and a cliche, um, cliche is a, is a printer's term. It basically means the same as stereotype, which you may recall is a metaphor that goes back to movable type. Every time you want to print something, you don't assemble one letter at a time. You have blocks of prefabricated phrases um, for simplicity's sake. It's a labor-saving device and a good one. The problem with cliches of speech is the labor they save you is the labor of thinking, the labor of choosing your words yourself. Um, I, I think the academy has been done great damage by seeing people who, when explaining the value of a liberal arts degree, talk about careful, critical thinking skills that you can transfer and apply throughout your lives. And then they get on Twitter, and you know what happens when they get on Twitter. But the same thing that happens to almost everyone who gets on Twitter. Um, the behavior calls the lie to the claim about transferability, or at least it draws attention to the fact that critical thinking skills and, and the skills involved in the careful use of language have the odd property that they are skills that we sometimes don't want to use. They're skills we sometimes want to turn off. Um, and I think insofar as you see examples of people who know better and can do better um, in the public uh, realm, they won't be able to be the kind of exemplars that are required to call people to, um, to account and to strive and to improve. Um, that's my time. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, bear with me just one minute. Um, I do want to...
Okay, well, I am just so thrilled to be up here, and already I've seen that though my co-presenters and I did not discuss beforehand, we have all sorts of synergies. Um, I want to also thank uh, Collegium. It's been such a pleasure watching you grow and seeing the intentionality and excellence of your work. Um, I also... Um, I'm from Penn, so it's not that I'm hailing from far away, um, but I also want to shout out uh, John Delio, who was my um, dissertation advisor and mentor for life. So though he's not here, I know his son is, so I'll tell him. Um, anyway, I am Leah Howard, and I um, have slides, which is like, woo! Um, no, just kidding. Not that you're, you didn't need slides. You were fluid and beautiful. But what I want to do with these slides and with my new found readers, which I now need, um, is just walk you through just a few ways in which I heard the questions of the digital age. I took it writ large. Like, what are the problems of the digital age? Um, and how do we pay attention. I think if you hear nothing else, hear me say that in the digital age, we need to pay more attention to both the inner conversation and the outer conversation if we are going to survive as moral persons. And so I think what, again, a lot of my colleagues said about where I see the key to that is paying attention to our practices. So in the little paper that I'm going to give to Dan, it's like almost done, Dan. Um, the title of it is Practicing Social Connection in the Digital Age, because it's something Ironically, um, or maybe not ironically, just interestingly, the internet was created to make social connection, and yet, the readers, I'm really sorry, I'm just getting used to it. And yet, though the you know, internet's uh, created for social connection, it's led to so much disconnection. And how do we then interact with students? How do we then form folks through our education? I think it's through paying attention, careful attention to our practices. And so I teach political science, and political information is the area in which I see um, less careful attention to practices, to put it nicely, what my colleague was saying about Twitter. Um, and so drilling down and figuring out these things, I think, are quite important. So I represent, um, I'm here, I work for the Padilla program, which is right across the street in College Hall from where you just were. The Padilla program is not a um, Christian organization, um, though I myself am. Uh, Padilla is a word that is Greek. Um, our funder, Starvos Nairakos, is Greek. And Padilla means the whole person. And so I ask my students to bring their whole selves and I bring mine um, in my teaching. So though I don't fit the category perfectly um, that uh, with my colleagues, uh, that's where I come to it. So in the Padilla um, universe, we are strongly, um, our major kind of theme is dialogue across difference, but we see dialogue as connected to these other things. And apparently, if anyone speaks Greek fluently or is a native Greek speaker, the word padia carries all those meanings. That when you are dialoguing across difference, you're deeply concerned with the wellness of the person you're speaking with. You want this relationship. You are also concerned with their citizenship and making the moral, making the world and especially your particular piece of the citizenry better. And you're also interested in service. And so with that said, today I just want to do a few things. I want to start with two stories, talk a little bit about teaching politics in the digital world, talk about throughout the importance of practice. And then I want to give you three concrete examples, ways I use practice and ways I focus on practice. So it'll be very like, um, uh, I don't know, you can touch it, what, what we'll do today. So here's the first um, story. So really interestingly, in the Padilla program, we have a communications director. And so we're all sitting in our room uh, in a, you know, for a team meeting, and our communications director is telling us about how Google Analytics will show you what happens with organic search. And as you may well know, I didn't. Organic search is, is what you type into the Google search box that gets you to our site. And apparently, the most um, we wanted the phrase of organic search to get people to our site to be dialogue across difference. Yeah, that's our, that's our mission. That's what we thought. And the phrase that got people to our site the most was this one, which is fascinating to me. This was a, a blog post I wrote um, in 2020, in November of 2020. I based it on Dasgessi's quote, the world will be saved by beauty. And so people typing in the world will be saved by beauty, searching 
Sephora, the world will be saved by beauty, ended up at our site. And herein, I find this so fascinating because in the actual blog post, and I'm going to read just a second, I was critiquing the digital world. But it was the digital world that brought people to the blog part post, right? That they were searching and found it, that they were connected to us, even though I was critiquing the very thing that they were using. And um, I was in the blog post, I was talking about how Dorothy Day loved this quote and how important it was for her service. And I wrote, and I will just read it quickly, uh, beauty is not a concrete concept with one definition. It's a concept that opens your imagination, that makes you pause, behold, and wonder. The exact opposite of information rabbit holes, which take you down ever narrow algorithmic corridors. Beauty widens and expands and allows for connections that defy linear analysis. There's freedom in beauty's infinite expression. I can marvel at your creative process. I can choose to share mine. Or I can watch as nature unfolds con countless processes all around. At this moment, when so much of our society seems broken and dysfunctional, where there's so much fear and anger and sadness, there's much to be gleaned from Dostoevsky's faith in beauty to rescue us. It's brave to create beauty when there's fear, and it might just save someone else. So I just I bring that out to say that... Um, just this story that people are searching for beauty even on the internet and even through means that I may be critiquing in the post. So I just found it interesting. And I just wanted also to have that because it's really beautiful right now in nature. This is what you may have walked through to get here, just an advertisement for Penn, but it's really beautiful right now in the fall. Um, I also, my second story comes from a good friend of mine, Rabbi Mike Yerum, who used to be the head of Hillel. He is now, um, I, uh, I guess his, name, his title, which I wrote down in my paper, I will have you know, he is the chief um, uh, learning officer, that's his name, the chief learning officer. And he talks about, he shared this story with me recently, um, and this is not connected to all that is going on right now, but I do want to say um, that my husband is Penn's chaplain, and it is it is a very challenging time, um, so I just want to say, say that first. Um, but in a conversation we had a month ago, he was sharing with me this this powerful story from the Midrash, and many of you may know it already. It was absolute news to me. And the Midrash, um, as you may know, it's, called, it's later rabbinic commentary. He, he described it to me, a later rabbinic commentary on the Hebrew Bible. And he said that when God revealed the Torah in this Midrash, where they wrote down um, what was happening from Moses on the Sermon of the Mount, um, when God revealed the Torah, it was not given in a clear-cut manner. Rather, for every matter in the law, God taught Moses 49 reasons for how something could be permitted or forbidden. In Hebrew, the word translated as reasons literally means faces. And I just want to pause. Reasons means faces. Um, in this sense, because the human perspective is limited and we live in an imperfect world, to better understand big T truth, we cannot accept simple and immediate answers. We need to delve into seeing 49 faces on each side of the issue. And what Mike talks a lot about is how 49 faces can also mean 49 people. And getting at things through face-to-face -face conversation, involving this concept of um, that we can, and this is the Hebrew word, makalet shem shayim, debate for the sake of heaven. That in our conversations with people, we can't fully see truth from the one perspective from the two, but maybe from the 49. And that when we're, this concept of debating for the sake of heaven means that relationship is primary to our conversation. Relationship is primary. So we're going to talk and kind of delve towards truth in a way that's both curious, in a way that is intellectually humble, which I've heard of my co-presenters say, and in a way that does not come in with self-righteousness. And these are practices that have to be practiced to be silly. You have to, like you're in a gym, work that out. It's not natural in the ways I think, again, studying and teaching political science, the ways we're conditioned by our information algorithms and the way we receive political information, it's not um, natural to be, um, to be humble and curious. But when you're looking for truth with the 49 face um, idea, it helps prompt that kind of uh, approach, that kind of predisposition um, to conversation. Again, so truth uh, is important and done in that way. Okay. Good. I still have a little bit of time. Great. Um, 
I'm not going to get into this, but teaching politics in 2023 means that we are constantly surrounded by this concept of effective polarization, right? Our, how we feel about folks that disagree with us, and those feelings are getting increasingly toxic. And so when we talk about politics, our cognition and our emotion are at play all the time, and often they're disintegrated. And so basically all of the other things that I have up there talks about how social media plays with that. One person who I think, um, this book is old, and Dan has heard me talk about it, and in fact, we did a, um, a reading group about it, and it just hasn't gone out of date, even though 2015 seems like ancient history. Um, but this book, Sherry Turkle, she's a psychologist at um, MIT, and she talks about um, reclaiming conversation, and by conversation, she distinctly means face-to-face, in-person conversation. And um, I, I went too fast by this first one, but she talks, she, the whole book is based on David Thoreau when he went to Walden. He had three t- chairs, one for solitude, two for con- friendship, excuse me, and three for society. And she talks about how, as they have there, these three chairs plot the points on a virtuous circle that links conversation to the capacity for empathy and self-reflection. In solitude, we find ourselves, we prepare ourselves to come into conversation with something to say that's authentic and ours. When we're secure in ourselves, we are able to listen to other people and hear what they really have to say. And then in conversation with other people, we come better at inner, we become better at inner dialogue. And then she talks about what happens through the digital world when we don't have that face-to-face regular encounter with other people. It doesn't just affect um, the way we speak to outwardly to others, it affects the way we speak to ourselves. And I find that fascinating to really think about. She talks about, um, I'll just, um, afraid of being alone, we struggle to pay attention to ourselves. And what suffers is our ability to pay attention to each other. If we can't find our own center, we lose confidence in what we have to offer others. Or you can work the circle the other way. We struggle to pay attention to each other, and what suffers is our ability to know ourselves. We face a flight from conversation. It's also a flight from self-reflection, empathy, and mentorship. But this flight is not inevitable where the virtuous cycles, circles broken, conversation cures. So, right, it's not out there. It's not scary. It's not hard to find. The cure is really in very in reach. And so it's like what I, I want to take from her is that the, the digital world is forming us. The digital world is giving us practices. And we need to be very attuned and pay attention to what's happening to our practices and try to then reverse those practices through things as simple as face-to-face conversation and especially with people that are different from ourselves. And that becomes very hard in the online space, um, but can be done, again, with intentionality. And so... um, I know I'm running very low on time, but another Vivek, the U.S. Surgeon General, um, has a recent book whose name is Together. Or the book is called Together. And it's about the epidemic of loneliness and how um, you know we can connect. And this. Um, is a really interesting quote. He talks about the comfort, calm, emotional energy we gain from all supportive friendships strengthens our emotional core. The stronger we are at the center, the more we have to offer everyone else in our lives. And I think this is very much connected to that idea of conversation, that we're doing this kind of, again, like working out in a gym. We are um, strengthening our emotional core when we're doing these things. And this is where, again, I think our students, um, who, as my colleagues have shared so well, they are really busy trying to be successful in a very competitive university and a very competitive world. And so um, sometimes the intentional conversations that, you know, what you're saying about what happens in the Cornell Dining Hall and we're talking about jobs and how to get ahead, they're not very beauty-filled or deep question-filled conversations. They're very um, instrumental conversations. And so how important these are. And I'll just land, I won't go into all of my practices, but I think the importance of paying attention to practices. And so, of course, I teach some of the events we've been doing this semester and then a larger project I have um, going right now called Political Empathy Lab are all geared at not just paying attention to the theory of dialogue or the theory of what I'm calling political empathy, which is a term that doesn't exist. It's a term that we define and make up in the class, um, kind of vis-a-vis deliberative democracy, which is a real term. Um, 
uh, we talk about yeah what that means, and, and I have a working definition in my paper. Um, no. uh, but well, I so I just I'll say some a practice from the course I teach, um, and these you're not supposed to read because I didn't really get permission from my students. But um, what, that's why it's like vague, vaguely blurry. But this is a practice I do the very first um, assignment they have in my class, political empathy and deliberative democracy. It's called an ISA, an individual service announcement. So just like the public service announcements we got so much during COVID, they have to write themselves an individual service announcement, what, how they're going to consume political information this semester. And they have to post it. They have to take a picture of them posting it above their desk. I mean, you know, um, but they, they know, they know. I mean, all of my students know how they're affected by uh, the digital world. And they say to themselves better things than I ever could say to themselves. And they, they post it up there. Another thing we do, this is a quick practice, and then I'll sit down. I have them walk one street in Philadelphia, and it's Walnut Street, which many of you have probably already been on. You could be staying at the at the Inn at Penn on Walnut Street. They walk from 50th Street to 2nd Street on Walnut Street with a partner. And they encounter the different Philadelphias on the walk because that one street will bring you in contact with many different Philadelphias. And the practice of walking with a partner and sometimes talking, I have them I have instructions for them sometimes to walk alone, sometimes with their partner, like leave their partner at a coffee shop and keep on walking. That practice of walking and observing and talking about it is something, again, it's it's like Sherry Turkle says, conversation is right there. There's something curative about that thing. And I haven't narrowed down all the reasons why it works against the digital world, but it does. And I think it, it's because it, well, uh, we can say more in the Q&A, but I think it bursts people's curiosity again. It takes people back to a, another place. Um, and then finally, political empathy lab. And then I promise I'll sit down. This is um, something I'm really excited about. The um, recently got funding from the provost. Uh, we are going to be traveling around all the counties in Pennsylvania this summer with a group of students, maybe maybe eight, maybe ten. And we, it's not tourism, and it's not um, polling, and it's not canvassing. Though we're going to use all the great organizations here are going to help us. But we're going to be encountering people, encountering people that live in our state that are um, from very different uh, settings than Philadelphia, from maybe more rural or more industrial um, or post-industrial places in Philadelphia. And we're going to be just encountering and working out the muscles of difference and talking to folks and practicing a repertoire of skills that we're developing. They're ever developing. Um, I don't have the skills that I'm cookie cuttering onto them. They're gonna help me develop the skills. So with that said, I think I'm going to just stop talking. Um, and to show you at the very end, I have some books there, which I think was kind of fun. I was like, I love doing that slide. So sorry, slides are new to me. But um, those are some of the books we use <laughs> in our organization. And I'm really happy to discuss. So I will now stop my voice.